You're listening to Gender, A Wider Lens. I'm Stella O'Malley, a psychotherapist in Ireland. And I'm Sasha Ayad, an adolescent therapist in the United States. Since 2016, my practice has been exclusively dedicated to gender questioning teens and families impacted by gender dysphoria. I also work with gender questioning teenagers and I facilitated support meetings for families and individuals who have been impacted by gender issues. We're curious about the concept of gender and how it's unfolding in the wider culture. Join us as we look at gender through a wider lens. In today's interview with Buck Angel, we discuss some sensitive adult topics around sexuality. Just wanted to give you a heads up in case there are kids around. Here's our conversation with Buck. Hi there. So today we have, uh, Stella and I have the pleasure of interviewing Buck Angel on our show. So hi, Buck, and welcome to our program. Hi, thank you. Thank you so much. I don't want to say ladies in case it's misgendering. (laughs) (laughs) We're ladies. I think that's fine. I'll speak on my on my behalf. You can call me a lady. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you can call me a lady. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. I appreciate you very much. Thanks for having me on. It, it might be stretching it a little bit to call me a lady, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> It's hard to know where to start, really. Yeah. Sorry, Sasha. It's hard to know where to start. You're kind of a monumental figure, very well known. I've I've never met, met you before, and I, I'm delighted to meet you. Um, where were you thinking of starting, Sasha? Because we're, I, I think I'm a bit awestruck. <laughs> well, I'd love to just give you the floor, Buck. Maybe you can, for anyone in our audience who doesn't really know, you've had quite a remarkable life and a remarkable career. So maybe you could just tell our audience a little bit about who you are and, and what are the things that you do these days. So I am what I consider a transsexual man. And what I mean by that is I was born female. I was, I'm 58 years old. I was born in the sixties and uh, I always felt like a boy. So I am a man who was basically born as a woman. And I had what we call a sex change back in the day to fully live my life as male. And I had an awesome childhood. I did not have a bad childhood. A lot of people would think that I had a bad childhood, but I didn't. My parents were very open to letting me live as Buck. And, you know, I think we call that tomboy. In Ireland, do they call that tomboy? I don't know. Yeah, but, and yeah. funny enough, I'm a little bit younger than you, but I was born in 1974. You were probably born in 62 or 62, something. 62, like yeah. 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 And I, I was, just so you know, I was similar to you insofar as I was very boyish and oh. what they call a tomboy and stuff like that. But I grew out of it and you <laughs> didn't. That's, that's right. I difference. grew into it. That's beautiful yeah. that you said that because I always tell everybody in my talks, my parents were like, oh, she'll grow out of it. And I'm like, I grew into it. <laughs> so I did. I grew into it. And, you know, the here's here's really the crux of my story is that I did not suffer as a child. I suffered as a as a as a sort of young teenager, mid adult. And why why I suffered was because I always felt male and the world saw me as a woman and I wanted them to see me as I look today. And so it, the most important part of my story is that I got to transition, meaning I got to take hormones and I got to have surgery. I did not have bottom surgery, so I do walk the world as a man with a vagina. And that is on some level really been a big part of my message to the world and sort of finding the space that you can live comfortably, not worrying what people think about you and moving through the world. So, so, I, so, so really the, the bottom line is that I had a sex change and now I live my life as a man. Could you tell me when you first found out about the concept of having a sex change? Do you yeah. remember that? Totally. Oh my gosh. So I suffered a lot. And in a sense, it, later on in life, when I started to not understand how I could become a man, that's when I suffered. So I suffered in my early 20s when I started drinking alcohol, when I started, you know, cutting myself, when I started, you know, and when I was uh, 16, I tried to commit suicide. I mean, my story is insane, you guys. Like, really, I, I can't even believe I'm sitting here talking to you because I shouldn't be. I really should be dead on some level. So at 16, I tried to commit suicide. And then alcohol and drugs became my life. And from there, it was a slippery slope. And I just went downhill from there. So really, that was the thing also that kept me sort of moving forward was that until I found a therapist, the therapist changed my life. And did the therapist suggest transitioning? So the therapist did not, did not. So I went to maybe 20 therapists prior to the one that eventually every single one of the therapists prior to that were just basically calling me a masculine woman, which is fine. That's totally fine. There's a lot of masculine women out there who probably should not be transitioning. But I did not get pushed into transition. I got sort of on some level 
Not even asked about it. Never asked about it. Always, you're a masculine woman. Always. So I stopped saying I feel like a man. I stopped saying it because I was not hearing the feedback I needed to hear from my therapist or my psychologist or my psycho, psych, what do they call yeah. it? Psychiatry. I went to psychiatry, which is a whole different level. And they gave me antidepressants, all of it. When did you first hear about transitioning? So not until I found a therapist who was a gay woman. She just started her practice. I was in my late 20s. And I remember specifically, I would go in to see her. And I got so tired of talking about my story. And the therapist had no feedback that I, so I sat in her office for like five sessions, 45 minutes with my hat down, not saying anything until one day I said, I got to say anything, say something to her. And I said, you know, Casey, I'll never forget. I took my hat off, which I never do. And I said, I feel like a man. And I was waiting for her to say, well, you're just a very masculine woman. And instead she said, I know. And you know, right now I'm going to (laughs) cry because- (laughs) Those words I know were the things that saved my life. And not one other therapist had ever said, I know. And just Mm. those words, about 26 years ago, I transitioned. But those words I know stick with me so deep because they were the one, the only one thing that connected me to what you see today. So she didn't push me. She just said, I know. How can we now move forward? You know, Buck, you you talk a lot in your interviews about how valuable this therapy was for you. And what I think you're saying is that somebody actually believed you. Yes. Believed that you had this persistent feeling. That's right. After that point in therapy where your therapist acknowledged your experience, where did the therapy go next? What else happened that you have found so powerful? Right. Listening to me, <laughs> hearing me, hearing me. That, and this is what I know what's happening today is people aren't being heard and there's so much anger and there's so much frustration. When you're not being heard, it frustrates you. And I don't care who you are. I don't care if it's dealing with your sexuality, your gender, maybe your marriage, dealing with whatever. If you're not heard, it's like, ah, hear me. So mm-hmm. you're my is my muck. So when I, so when she said, I know, as you see, those are the two words I'll never forget in my whole life. And so from that moment on, she's like, (laughs) she literally, and I'm really great friends with her today. She saved my life. And so she said to me afterward, uh, after my crying session, she said to me, now, (laughs) now what are we going to do? Because I don't know anything and you don't know anything. So we're going to do this together, Buck, and we're going to figure it out together. And so we did, we, we figured it out. How? I don't know, because there was no internet. There was no way for us to Google transition, trans, what you see today. All of that did not exist. We had to find books or other people or things who could sort of lead us, which there was none of that. None of it. Do you mind me asking when you said, I feel like a man, Mm -hmm. were you thinking, I want to change to be a man? Or were you thinking, Mm -hmm. I'm in terrible pain because I'm not a man? What were you thinking? Yeah, it's such a beautiful question. For me, it totally was, I am. I know I am. I feel something inside of me feels that my outside is not. It's, it was more about my physical appearance because what I knew was I already knew I was a dude. Like I, I knew it inside of me. I knew the way people treated me, all the other kids treated me that way when I was young. I was very solid in my desire to be one of those young boys, right? And then be my dad and then be a man. So it was that. I I had this uh, just intense feeling of wanting to look and be and walk the world as a as a man and as a boy. So I don't really know any other way to sort of explain that other than that. It, it felt like it on my inside, but what didn't connect was my outside. And that I knew was the problem because people kept seeing me as a female and I kept saying, no, I'm a man. Do you think back in the <laughs> in the 70s and the 80s, people were, were OK with that? They thought you were insane where I did end up in a psychiatric hospital. Wow, did you? Yeah, I did. Actually, after I tried to commit suicide at 16, I ended up in the psych, psych ward for a month. Yep, totally, mm-hmm. because they didn't understand. No, back then, nobody understood. That was 78. No, let's see, yeah. 76, 78 yeah. around there, I was, yep, yep. That sounds incredibly traumatic. <sighs> and, am I right in thinking you had, because I saw pictures of you when you yeah. were a woman, you're extraordinary, extraordinary be- uh, beautiful. Yeah. 
And did you, were you a model in your 20s? <laughs> I totally was. I'm telling you my story. Sometimes I'm like, is this actually my life? <laughs> because sometimes I'm like so disconnected from it. I can't even believe I did that many things in my life. So yeah, I was actually a real model who actually really went to London and really modeled. And I was like pretty much considered one of the very first androgynous models before mm -hmm. that came. So I was on the very much of the forefront of the androgyny movement. And that's why they wanted me so bad because I totally looked like a little, no one could tell my gender, you know, at that, at, at my age. I think I was and late for a model too. That was in my mid twenties, which nobody models in their mid twenties. They model when they're 16. When, when that was happening and people were kind of categorizing you as androgynous, mm -hmm. did that feel to you as a step closer to how you want to be seen? Or was that actually, was that ambiguity part of your distress too with your dysphoria? Because it sounds like you had, at least internally, a very clear sense that I feel like a man, I want to be seen as a man. So mm -hmm. what was it like to be categorized in this more ambiguous place yeah yeah so so no people still saw me as female right people still even though i was very butch and very i still was a woman i didn't have any masculine traits other than that you know that androgyny kind of thing but when i opened my mouth i had a very female voice and you know i still i still didn't have it, what you see here so that being said no it, it, even though i was androgynous i got to model boy clothes or whatever no i still felt very female i still struggled and i struggled more in my modeling career because that was where alcohol and drugs were just given to you. They're just there, you know, for many reasons. What really strikes me as a, as a, something that's kind of pounding in my head here is that, you know, your looks were what were against you. Your outer pr presentation was your issue. Yes. And then you went to modeling where it's all about yes. your outer presentation. And I saw the photos and I thought you just looked beautiful. I hadn't even... <laughs> I know you were known as androgynous, but I just thought, mm. beautiful woman. I, I didn't actually see the androgyny as much as both right. of you are talking about. So right. it's amazing. What made you go for the one thing that was burning yeah. in, your, in your brain? Gosh, I get that question a lot because it's actually really so powerful what I'm going to tell you, drugs and alcohol. <laughs> and that's what I saw. I, so I had a girlfriend. And so what happened was I was literally walking down Hollywood Boulevard and some dude gave us his card. And he's like, dude, you could be a huge model. And like, I'm like, dude, get away from me, weirdo. And then my my girlfriend at the time grabbed the card and she's like, you got to do this. She was hmm. obsessed with me becoming a model. So I'm like, OK, I'll just do it for her. And so on some level, I did it for her. And it was insane. Like I was being sort of groomed to be this. You know, I hated it. There was drugs and alcohol. And so really, on some level, that was the only thing I, did. I, I couldn't even look at myself in the mirror when the when the makeup artist makeup artist loved me because I was like a blank slate. Right. So then they could just make me look this way and they would just be like, oh, my God, look at your and I could never look at myself ever. So it on some level really was about me getting drugs, alcohol, money and those things and not paying attention to the outside of that. Of, it was of almost doing a job that didn't suit you for money. That's right. That's 100%. You know, eventually I ended up being homeless and prostituting on the street, which also wasn't a chosen <laughs> profession at the time, but it was Pre survival. Pre-transition. Pre-transition. Oh, yeah. Pre-transition. Mm -hmm. Pre-transition, I ended up so from my modeling career where I went yeah. to London and everyone's grooming me to be this huge new model. I, I was literally literally getting i got a plane ticket to go i mean a train ticket to go to paris to go to be the first female model in this male agency and i actually physically missed the train because i was drunk and i didn't wake up and you know they drink like mad in the uk and i'm just like Ugh. that was it that was the last straw they, they said you're done we're sending you back to the states because i was just a mess and they did and i had nobody here my parents had disowned me already i had no friends i overused their couches and oh, basically i ended up totally living in santa monica boulevard there and you know prostitution isn't something you go to school for and survival prostitution and so i just learned how to do it by dressing like this putting my hat over my eyes walking the street as a young boy really on some level and then it was just so easy like men would stop <laughs> men would pull over hey and then i learned the language and i learned that and that's when i started like totally smoking crack and i realized 20 bucks is how much a rock costs and so i would just go i would only you know like sort of master i would masturbate them or give them um blowjobs yeah. 
that was it. And, you know, five, 10 minutes and I'd make 20 bucks. And so it became that thing in and out of cars. And I did that for a while too. So survived. Yeah. <laughs> wow. It's, it's fascinating because I'm also aware that, you know, you also had a, I guess you could say an illustrious career in pornography as one of yeah. the first yeah. transgender porn actors. Yes. And it's just like, uh, there's this pattern that I'm observing that the thing that really drove you crazy, which is your body and your presentation ended up being something that you actually relied on mm -hmm. to move yourself forward in the world. And I think that's an interesting kind of juxtaposition. C can you share with our audience a little bit about your experiences in pornographic work? What was that yeah, like? Definitely. So because I'm very proud of my pornography work. Now, pornography is not for everybody. It's not something people, everyone should have the opportunity to like it or dislike it or watch it or not watch it. That's totally how I feel. That being said, I, I had a wife at the time who was a professional dominatrix. And through that, I started working with a trans woman on the internet and really teaching myself. I want you to also understand I'm, I'm not a high school graduate. I'm a total dropout from high school. I have no formal education. I'm not an academic. I was called that dummy, right? So on some level, I also feel like I have to prove myself because the whole world was always calling me a dummy. And I'm like, I'm not a dummy. So mm -hmm. that being said, I have really a lot of desire to create and to show, uh, you know, Know, to prove people wrong on some level. And so that being said, I was with a wife who was a professional dominatrix and I started learning how to make websites and I, we built a huge like sort of empire in the pornography domination world. And I noticed because I started working with a trans woman that there was so much trans women pornography. It was crazy. I'm like, but wait a minute, where am I? There what was year no, are we here? What year that is was this? Ni that was 2001, 2000, 2001. And I was like, wait a minute, there's no, and that internet was just really kind of ripe. That's when pornography really kind of yeah. just started to hit there. And so I was very successful in my other business with my, with my dominatrix wife. We were making homemade movies, literally getting people to pay us $500 for VHS homemade movies. We were making so much money. It was crazy. And then I just saw that there was no trans woman, no, no trans man porn. None. Did not exist. Did not exist. And I just had the idea. And my, I'll never forget. My friend said to me, dude, that is the most brilliant idea. You will change the world. And I was like, dude, I'm just making porn. I want to make a million dollars. I don't care about changing the world. Who it was are never your clientele? Who, who's the so great question, right? I actually created a genre of pornography. <laughs> that's my claim to fame. That didn't exist. And if you think about it, that's kind of insane because Google anything right now, you'll see it, right? You'll, you, mm -hmm. you can see foot smoking, gum chewing, clown yeah. porn. And there wasn't me. And so oh, I just... Gay men. Uh, right. So who's going to watch my porn? Yeah. Who, right. Who's watching it? So I made a movie with me and all bi uh, biological, I call them, but we call them cisgender today. So cisgender women, right? I made a movie like that. Then I made a movie with all cisgender dudes. And then I made a movie with women and men. And the number one movie that sold was with all men. And so mm -hmm. that became my customer base was gay men. And it was insane. Nobody could even believe it because the gay men were writing me these crazy letters but the other gay men were like, you're disgusting. You're a woman. Get out of our, get out of our world. You're sick. Like, I couldn't believe the stuff they were writing me. I will kill you. I got death threats. I got everything from all over the world. People hated me. They hated well, me. <laughs> isn't so surprised. I know you want to jump in. I think me and Sasha are falling over. <laughs> so but um, part of me isn't so surprised because I've heard so many gay men be really quite disgusted by a vagina that's and the, right. the, a visceral reaction to it. So I imagine that's where the letters from. I'm almost more intrigued by the gay men who wanted it. I'm like, yeah, wow. yeah me too. Well, so, that's so, very interesting. I, believe me, I did. Cause that was the last p person I ever thought would be interested in me. But then I started to realize, look at me, right? I'm yeah, totally a dude. I'm totally a dude. I mean, even if I took my clothes off right now and I covered my vagina, you would still be like, dude. But even when I uncover my vagina, it, it's changed so much from the testosterone that it's, you know, it doesn't even really much look like a vagina these days. So that, that said, I, on some level, feel very lucky 
because mm-hmm. I got to introduce vagina to gay men and to men who have never, who have been freaked out by it, don't want to touch it. And it's literally like after I introduced it to them, they couldn't stop. <laughs> they couldn't, I'm like, because vagina is actually made. It's actually made to have, you know, intercourse. That's like an I actual know. thing. Yeah. So I'm like, <laughs> that's why it feels good. <laughs> and it was crazy. Like I, I had sex with men who had never in their life, you know, 30 year old, 50 year old men who never had sex with a vagina. Who are, who are attracted to the male form. And that's then they right. Do- concept of the vagina is actually a very pleasant that's right thing. i mean on some level i feel happy that i got to introduce them to vagina <laughs> I, know, I remember having a conversation online with um somebody who's a gay man and i was talking with him about you know is it really true that trans men get a lot of play from gay men and what he said was that a lot of trans men have a soft attractive boyish cute look Oh, which gay men find very attractive. Yep. And there is there is an attraction there. And I think it gets really tricky because I I completely empathize with the feminist and you know LGB argument that sexual orientation has to do with biological sex. I get mm. where that comes from and I agree with it. Mm. And also it's very complicated because there can be um you know, attractions that we have for someone if they're playing that role well. That's right. That's and I right. think that's where that ambivalence comes in. Like if if somebody didn't know who you were, Buck, and is attracted to men, and then you started to become intimate with them, the second they see your genitals, they might have this like, oh God, oh God, what's happening? But up until that moment, there is a genuine comfort and attraction to you as a man so it's really Mm -hmm. tricky and it's not so simple as just yes you can be attracted to anybody based on their gender identity and it's Mm -hmm. also not so simple as you would never be attracted to somebody trans just because their biological sex is different so there's a lot of gray area here i think that's right. Thank you for saying that because, you know, right now in the, and there's just so much of this discussion of you have to be attracted to it. If you're not attracted to a trans person, you're transphobic. I am so disgusted that anyone, I've been working in the sexual wellness field for 20 years. And I'm telling you, that is such a bunch of nonsense. The stuff I had to deal with early on with gay men, now they see trans men. No, 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 no. They never did that before. I had to get a, take a beating by gay men in order for them to understand we are dudes. And I I had to explain to them your attraction to us is physical. Our body, whatever you're seeing there is, you might get to the vagina, but by the time you get to the vagina, you're going to be like, oh, he's a dude. So you have to understand where your attraction, you're not just attracted to penis, you're attracted to the whole picture. So, so it's really been a very uh, sort of awesome that I could do that. But at the same time, we have just this stigma of like, if you're not attracted to somebody, you're homophobic or you're not, people are attracted to people, things. They're not, you know, and I also want to say this, I disclose close always before I have sex. I never have sex without without ever disclosing who I am and what I am because I think it's disrespectful, but that's just my space. Is it just your space or is it an appropriate space? Well, it's an appropriate space, but I can't um I cannot force anyone to disclose and I have been called uh I have been called victim blank <laughs> by community some not my whole community. There's some in my community who just always want to take the piss out of me for some reason. They're just constantly after me. So, so yeah, I guess uh, when I say you should disclose because you'll create a better space, they call that victim blaming. And I'm mm. like, what? I go, you're going to less get yourself into a space of victimization if you actually are honest about who you are. Are you going to disclose that you have HIV? Because mm-hmm. you're better. Are you going to disclose you have an STD? You're better, right? Yeah. It's not really the same yeah. sort of courtesy. There's a bit of irony because the same, you know, the same argument would hold that consent is very important. And yes. yet there's no consent in some communities. Right. There's no consent when it comes to disclosing your that's you right. know, biology that's or who you are. So and I, don't I think agree. That's, that's a good point. But. Yeah, I don't agree. But again, I'm not. So I, I got because I told the community, you need to disclose you need to disclose. There was a, a trans woman who had gotten killed at the time. And so she had gotten killed because she went home with a guy. And then the guy found out that she was actually, you know, a trans person and she still had a penis. And he killed her because he freaked out because he thought she was a woman. And I said, this is why we need to disclose. And then all of a sudden I became the victim blamer. I'm like,
like, I'm not blaming her. I'm using her as an example. And I'm saying these are the things that we need to look at. We need to use these horrible experiences as a means and a way to have better lives and not fear going home with somebody. I don't understand why people don't see my intention there. I, I do think there's another reason to disclose, which is kind of owning yourself and being you who go. you are and being Beautiful. proud. Who, yeah, to being Beautiful. proud to, to be who you are. And this is, you don't have anything to hide. I think when That's people, right. you know that great phrase, we're only as sick as our secrets. I think it's yeah. true. I Me think too. it's true. Me I too. Could I ask you something? I hope you don't find it um, too probing, but no. you know, you decided not to have phalloplasty. Mm-hmm. And you, you decided to let's say, keep your vagina. Part of me thinks, um, it, to me, I suppose that you, you it's for it's, it feels like it's the presentation of the male was much more important to you than the yeah. the the thing that isn't seen, which is the vagina. And I'm yeah. wondering psychologically, where's what's that? Yeah, so it's it's a bit difficult because I'll be honest with you, I probably would have gotten the surgery back in the day if it was acceptable enough for me. Again, my story, I'm going to tell you, I'm not anti-bottom surgery, but I am. I'm a, this is my story and why I choose not to do the bottom surgery. So back in the day when I transitioned 26 years ago, we didn't even have the internet. So I couldn't even really see what these, as it started to progress and men started putting them in clubs i just in in like you know in the internet when you can go into like a private yahoo group so people started posting their results and i just wasn't happy with the results and i I didn't see the thing i needed to see and i also didn't see erection i didn't see uh urination through it i saw horrible scars on people's bodies and i saw all of these problems with it and i saw gangrene happening and then i know a guy who actually had to have it removed and now he has no i hear you i hear you (laughs) <laughs> but I, I, I'm surprised that didn't make you think, well, I need to step back because the, the, the last step, which is the, the vagina, which, you know, completes the, the, the kind of the outer That's and right. the inner or whatever, it completes yep. the presentation. I'm yep. not taking, will that not be a stone in my shoe for the next 26 years? And yes. has it been? No. So, I, of course, I thought that. I'm like, I'm never going to. I'm never going to survive this. I need to have a penis. There's no way I could ever live my life. How am I going to have sex? How am I going to have all of those things? And so I'm going to tell you that the, re- the, the defining factor in me keeping my vagina was masturbation. And so I started to masturbate secretly without telling anybody because I was embarrassed of my masturbation of my vagina. And so I started to masturbate and I had an orgasm and I'll never forget that <laughs> orgasm. <laughs> I'm like, I'm, I'm, not not getting- angel. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm not getting rid of my vagina. This thing is amazing. When, when was this age wise? What time? What's the timing the of that? First year of my transition. So I was like, what, my early 30s, I think. Wait, wow. you had yeah. never orgasmed before you started transition. So. I never internally orgasmed, right? I never put anything inside of me. So I did clitoral orgasm, but only in the dark, drunk. <laughs> I was like a mess, right? So most of the time with my clothes on, uh, things of that nature. So I was not comfortable sexually with my vagina as a woman, uh, especially as a butch woman and dating feminine women. So I was in that pretty much that space when I was a gay woman. I was very much into the butch femme space. And so, yeah, so it wasn't uh, my boobs were totally off limits, uh, things like that. So it wasn't until I became more masculinized and I started to the testosterone heightened my libido. And I, and I just did it because it was like, I couldn't not do it. And it was, yeah, that was the most liberating, <laughs> liberating day of my life on some level. Mm-hmm. And I really had to think about it. I had to think about it. It was and a it long didn't time. make you more friends. Well, it did make you more friends with your vagina. Yeah. I, are you kidding me? It's my best friend. <laughs> so yeah, that's when I was like, wait a minute. All of the guys I know, because there was more guys starting to come around during this time, and we had those little Yahoo groups, they were all focused on the penis. And I was freaked out because I wasn't, so I wouldn't voice mm-hmm. it. I wouldn't talk about it because I was too scared that the guys were going to think I was weird. Had you, uh, I let you come in, Sasha, because I know we're dominating here, but had you orgasm when you were 20? So before, rubbing. What would have rubbing. happened? Yeah. So I would get on top of my girlfriend or whatever if I wasn't drunk or high and just rub and grind as a man, you know, like just like that. But had had you had the experience that you had in your early 30s, had you had it, might that have 
made life easier for you? No, no, it wasn't. No, it wasn't necessarily about sex. So okay. I had sex, but I had it in a weird way. But that okay. said. No, I don't think so because it was so internalized. My desire to be male, my desire to okay. be male, overrode anything out okay. there. It would have overrode sex if that was the case. So I most definitely think that it wasn't. You know, and I get your question, and I think it's an important question. I think there's two things that are coming up for me. So one, I find it very interesting that when you started transition, I'm going to just throw mm-hmm. a guess out there. Yeah, it started to physically validate what you wanted to be. And only then did you give yourself permission to experiment with penetration, which might have felt like a hyper feminine thing to do. So it's like once you crossed that threshold where you felt validated as someone in the male role, then you were allowed to experiment with your body, which I find fascinating. And I have seen that kind of dynamic, though not play out in the same way with lots of my clients, that when mm-hmm. they start, for example, I mean, you know, there's a large cohort of rapid onset gender dysphoric kids right. these days. And right. what I have seen is that sometimes only when a young female starts T, does she allow herself to wear a pink sweater, for example, or like right. do something that she thought was feminine that she wanted to do, but wasn't quite able to because her gender dysphoria created right. the drive to be more masculine. And then I guess the second thing I'd love to ask you about, Buck, is that I often think about what are the psychological characteristics that probably help someone transition successfully? And these days, my impression is that a lot of young people are embarking on transition without having the psychological traits that they need to do <laughs> so right. successfully. That's and like two things I'm noticing about your story is that one, you found a way to radically accept yourself, even though you didn't quite fit in either box perfectly well. You weren't the typical trans guy who was going all the way with phalloplasty, and you obviously don't see yourself as a woman, but you found a way to be okay with this third space. And maybe we could talk a little bit about your medical experience, because you have been through hell and back. (laughs) So true. And you have stayed because you probably had no choice, but you've stayed radically grounded in the fact that the body is real, pleasure in the body is important and real, and like taking care of our health is real. I know you've campaigned a lot for health for trans people. So like, can you share with our audience a bit about what what kind of a guinea pig basically you became yeah. in the medical yeah. world? Yeah, thank you. Thanks for all of that. So, so yeah, I actually am a guinea pig. So really what happened was my great therapist, her name is Casey Weitzman, by the way. And she, after that, she started the Gender Center here in Los Angeles. So she just geared her whole practice towards the trans community. And if you need an introduction, I can. But that being said, so after that, we said, how are we going to do this? And so one of the things we did is we, we actually contacted Stanford University because they just had started, a, I think, a gender identity program there. And they sent me a book. Look, you see how thick that is a booklet that big that I had to fill out of my history, everything, blah, 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 blah. Sent it back to Stanford. Never, ever to this day heard back. So that puts you in a weird space. And so then I just go to the bookstore and I find this thing and it says the resource guide for transgender women. So men, so men becoming women. And I'm, there was just something that clicked in my head. I was like, oh, that's opposite. Inside of there, I found a doctor, okay, and Dr. Leave. And Dr. Leave said that he does hormones for male to female transsexuals. So I told my therapist and she said, call him. So I called him and he was like, old not that that's a bad thing but old and he he's like get a note from your therapist which is what we had to do back in the day get a note from your therapist i brought it to him he basically told me he's never ever worked with a woman becoming a man he's only ever worked with men becoming women and he's more than happy to help me but i'm he said it you will be my guinea pig and i at the time i was like Well, I'm not really sure exactly what that means, but like, I don't care because I did have the mantra. The mantra of my mind was, if it doesn't work out, I'll kill myself. I said it every day, every day till about maybe even 10 years into my transition. If it doesn't work out, I'll kill myself. It was my safety. It was the place where I felt like I could just take myself out. And who cares about if nothing works? Because again, remember, I didn't get to see any other trans guys. I didn't get to see what I was going to look like. I'm an experiment. It's scary. You're totally alone. You were totally alone. I don't think people even understand it. They don't. And I had a girlfriend at the time who dumped me. 
<laughs> she dumped me because she was like, you're starting to look <laughs> like a gym queen because I was like going to the gym and pumping up. And, you know, she was a gay woman. And here I am changing to a man. And it's totally understandable. But that so was you didn't know You didn't know any trans men? None. None. Okay. I didn't know what I was doing. I had no idea what I was oh doing. My God. It was like insane. And so all I saw was this booklet of, of men becoming women. And then from that, so I did, I started the testosterone and, but and God, that doctor, swear to God, that's going to make me cry too, because he was insanely amazing. And he taught me how to inject myself. And he said, kiddo, you're going to have to do this for the rest of your life. And I don't want you coming in here and I don't want you relying on me. You're going to rely on yourself. And I was like, I'll never forget that. These, I, I was taken care of by real professional people people who cared about me. And so from that, I decided that I wanted to get my breasts removed. But how do I do that? There's not, <laughs> there's not even any doctors that do that. So I went to a bunch of doctors in LA, Orange County, around. I found people who did uh, mastectomies for for women. And so then I thought maybe that's the same thing. And pretty much all of them called me a freak. All of them were like, you're disgusting. All of them were like, gross, get out of here. And I was like, I don't want those scar. I don't want scars. And then, and cause I thought they would just have to basically chop them off. And then I said, I would like to try to get a chest that doesn't show. And they're like, that's not possible. If you want it, it's this amount of money. And I'll just, you know, and I'm like, wow, it was so Ugh. It was so depressing and gross. And I just thought, what am I going to do? You know, I, I use duct tape to, to strap my boobs down back in the day and ace bandages. We didn't have binders. So we had to come up with things that were just everyday things. And so all of a sudden I went, I decided, why don't I just go back to that book? And I went back to the book and there was a Dr. Gary Alter who does plastic surgery. He does urology at UCLA, head of urology at UCLA. He created vagioplasty. He created all of these things. He works with trans women. And I called him. He said, come in. And he said, you know, man, I've never worked. <laughs> and I'm like, I heard this before. I've never worked with a, ma- a woman becoming a man, but I'm willing to try this new surgery on you. And I'm like, let's do it, dude. And um, he, the keyhole incision. And so he did the keyhole on me and it came out amazing. And so what, like, what is that keyhole incision? The keyhole incision is where they cut right underneath your areola. So they take all the breast tissue out. And so I was in experiments the first time he had ever done it. So that, you know, some men have these scars along here. It also really depends on the size of your chest. So I had very small breasts. So they just, some people have to get the larger scars because of this type of surgery. So I was lucky enough to just be able to underneath the areola and they just take the breast tissue out, but he left a small amount of breast tissue. And this is how great he is so that I wouldn't be concaved, right? Because that's what happens if you see breast cancer, mm-hmm. a lot of times I have to take it all out. So he left breast tissue. And so I still have to get breast exam, um, can't uh, be examined for breast cancer. That because- sounds like the same procedure used for breast reductions. Are you aware? Is that similar? Very similar, but, but it's, at the same time, because I had such small boobs that it was, a- and then w- when you see my chest now, it's all naturally built from just doing millions of push-ups. But that that's just really like that's how amazing the body really adapted. My body adapted to testosterone so fast; it was crazy. And that was it. And both my doctors, I was, and I was an experiment. I was a hundred percent experiment. And when did it? Did it? I know it went wrong. So did the first few years go right, or like you know what was the process? It was right, considering that I wasn't sick. I took care of myself, right? I don't drink. I don't do drugs. I'm very athletic. I really focused on my health, which is the reason why I think I am so healthy at 58. And that, so what happened was 10 plus years on long-term testosterone, all right? Remember, I'm a guinea pig. Remember this story. So I'm taking, I'm actually injecting testosterone into my body. That's a female, biologically female body, which means I have a reproductive system. I have a period. I have all the things that you two have. Yet nobody has studies on what testosterone, which is not a natural substance in my body. And I'm putting something and overriding my natural sex hormones. This is insane if you think about it, right? But for somebody like myself, it's not. It's like a gift. So, uh, But even though I didn't know it was going to happen, I'm willing to take that on. That's the really important part of, is that people have to understand we're willing to take these on when we know that we can't live the way we look in the world. And so so that being said, I took I took it on. I just started changing, changing, changing. I started getting cramps 
And I started saying three or four years in, I started getting these weird cramps after sex, after I would orgasm. And I was, they were insane, you guys, like insane. Like, you know, period cramps when they're like doing that weird sort of, uh, but then they got worse and worse and I couldn't stand up. I would have to lay down. I would cry. I'd go to the gynecologist. They're like, nothing's wrong with you. I'm like, but (laughs) there is something wrong with me. So what they were doing is they were giving me a pap smear, right? And a pap smear, I think, only goes into the cervix. Is that right? Yeah, so they do that. <laughs> and so then I actually know more about my vagina than most women do, <laughs> sadly to say. But that – so what happened was long-term use of testosterone atrophied my cervix to my uterus. And if anybody out there knows, the vagina is like a self-cleaning oven, right? We need to have that space to go. So nothing was coming out. And then it was literally becoming a Petri dish my uterus and one day it just popped and that's what those cramps were it was the infection coming and nobody so they were only giving me a pap smear they should have been giving me an ultrasound because then they could have seen the 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 atrophy of my vagina so bottom line is i got us i popped became septic and you know what that means, death pretty much. And uh, I got to the hospital. I lived in Mexico at the time. And I, I remember going in and being like, I have a vagina because I knew they were going to take my pants off. And then they were like, who's this crazy dude? <laughs> I have a vagina. They think I'm like, this guy's hallucinating <laughs> over here. He thinks Excellent. <laughs> I'm just like, they think I'm hallucinating. They're like, chill out, dude. You're fine. <laughs> and it's, oh and it's in, in Spanish, it's a fajina, right? So I'm having to speak Spanish to them. <laughs> So if vagina, vagina, and they're thinking like, "What?" I, I'm like, "I got a, I got a vagina." <laughs> so oh anyway, God. they were amazing. They were amazing, more amazing than any medical doctor I've ever had in the United States. They just did it. They did it. They said, "Oh my God!" They said this to me. Oh my God! What the hell? They could not believe my reproductive system. They were like, it was literally like, um, just twisted. They, they said, and the t- one doctor who's worked 20 plus years in gynecology, he said, I've never seen anything like this. And he started to write a paper on it because it's just never. Mm-hmm. Did they give you a hysterectomy? Yeah, they gave me a full uh, vaginal hysterectomy, which is pretty awesome. So they just go in through the vagina and they take it all out. So I don't have any scars across there. It's a pretty amazing surgery. They gave me a very high end, awesome surgery. Yeah. So yeah, they ripped everything out after three months of hardcore test, um, hardcore antibiotics because I was so infected they couldn't touch me. And how many years into testosterone was that? That was between ten and thirteen or something like that. I can't remember the exact time, but so after ten years, it's just the cramps were from four years on, so oh. four to ten, cramping all the time. Everyone's blowing me off, and then I'm like, I almost die. It's unbelievable that they just give out testosterone today. Did it turn you off sex if you were if you were having pain? Of course it does, but at the same time, I'm just too much of a sex person. I love sex a lot, so I would just deal with the cramps. (laughs) You know what I mean? Take Advil. Like I had period cramps. You know, nowadays it's well known. At least I think it's well known that female people on T will have this kind of problem down the line and the pain after sex and the awful cramping. And I guess, um, you know, Stella and I have our own perspective on how seriously should people be taking these kinds of transition procedures. But I'd love to hear from you, because on one hand, I can imagine if all of this knowledge had been readily available, your road would have been much easier And on the other hand, when we make it seem like, oh, no biggie, in five years, just get a hysterectomy, and it's not a big deal. I think that minimizes how seriously a a person should take these procedures and really evaluate, is this the road for me? You know, you, you said, like, for you, if this doesn't work, I can kill myself. And I've also met some people who are actually functioning quite well and they're not really suicidal, but they take transition so lightly that they're like, oh, no biggie. I'll just get on tea and get a histo. So what do you think about that? Well, I'm actually, wow. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. This is the problem that I have as an elder. And so because I'm an elder and an older person who's transitioned a long time and have a lot of information, again, I need people to understand my story is my story and everyone's transition should be different and is different. We are not the same. We are not a monolithic group of people. And so that being said, it's why mental health care should be the number one thing you do 
before you even touch any type of medication, any type of anything. You got to get your mind together and you got to understand that testosterone isn't a fly by night thing. It isn't, I'm just going to take it. And if it doesn't work out, I'm just going to not take it. It's not that. And also that's an abuse of something that saved my life. And so on some level, I feel like now we're just this sort of like, because people like me, I'm not the, um, there are people before me who opened the doors. I did not do the work that a lot of people before me did. But that being said, these people took it in a way that we need to respect this in a, in a way that I feel it's not being respected. And I feel it's too readily available. And I feel like it's too much on some level, like, I just want to try it. And it's not a something to me that you want to try. It's something to me that you need to do. And it's why gender dysphoria, the, the actual diagnosis of gender dysphoria is still important to me and why I really talk about being a transsexual and not a transgender person. And so I really stay in that medical space because that's the thing I know. I know nothing about what's happening in the other transgender world. I know everything that's happening in the medical world. And so m- my focus is medical trans kids mostly not even trans youth or adults. It's mostly trans kids and understanding that, yeah, I was a trans kid. Yeah, I didn't get hormone blockers. Yeah, I became suicidal. Yeah, here I am. So, you know, I'm going to say I don't want kids to be suicidal. 100% I don't. But I want kids to understand life sucks sometimes. <laughs> and, and if I didn't do the things I did, I wouldn't be this guy I am. So you need to struggle. I do believe in struggle. But I believe that there's a certain type of struggle that you can eliminate and certain type of struggle that needs to be part of the the growth process. Um, There's something occurs to me when you're talking there that often occurs to me around trans is that it feels full time and feels like a full time job. That's and right. I, I, I wonder. I wonder a lot about that. Yeah, you should. I wonder. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I wonder is there more to you that hasn't been explored? That's a great because, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I, I, I do wonder, think so. Is it a very, is it, I wonder, is it a very sexualized um, existence? Is it a very looks-based existence? Mm, great questions. I love those questions. Yeah. And most people live very, you know, they live in, the, in that world. And absolutely, there's no world that's better. If you follow me, everybody has their own world to live in. But that's I'm right. thinking about it and I'm thinking, is that, draining sometimes that you mm-hmm. you know you're thinking of your presentation and your transness and your yeah so great question and i want to i want you to know that i do 100% i do i'm constantly worried about the way i look i'm constantly worried about my body i'm constantly but you have to also understand i'm a person who's actually a public figure so that yeah. also being said i have to have i have standards uh, in my own standards right so these are yeah, my and own you became a public figure so they both they both fall in with each that's other that's right people, that's right yeah. so on some level my masculinity is so important to me it's everything mm-hmm. to me and i will never lie about that ever it is everything to me and so you know my beard is everything Thing to me yeah. it is it seems so it seems so um childish for lack of a better it seems so immature but it's not it's something i really value and i value the 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 gift i i think of this as a gift and that's what i want people who are transitioning to understand this is a gift many people across the world don't ever wow. get to live their true life and so i feel that there's some some there's some there's some out there who are not grateful for what is being given to them. And I see that as a, as a, as a de- detriment to the trans world, because if, if it's just that easy, then people are going to start having backlash towards us because they're going to be like, why are you just giving kids testosterone? Why are you just doing this? Why, why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you doing this? Because now we have detransitioners and now there's this, and I see it happening at a fast rate. Every single trans person is different. We are not the same. And so what I need is different than what your client Tommy needs, right? At, but I think at the same time, it is important to understand for a transsexual, and it's why I continue to do that, transsexual people, it's all about our presentation. It's all about our appearance. We have gender dysphoria. We need to walk the world in the gender we want to be. That, that's so simple. There's, no, there's nothing more simple than that. A lot of people want to leave their looks behind. Just yep. I yep. am who I am. I don't even want to think. I don't even want to think about my looks. Oh, whatever. Because you don't have to. 
because you don't have to, if that okay. makes sense. I think we, okay. again, I don't want to speak for the trans community because yeah, I'm not, but I, but I can say from me, my own experience and my, my friends, my transsexual friends, we, we, we live for our, we live for our experience. We live no. for our, the way we look. That's just how we live. And on some really level, it is exhausting. That. It's exhausting. (laughs) Every day I have to like worry about the way I look. It's exhausting. (laughs) And so many people who've detransitioned have said, I became exhausted. It's the real common word. I got tired. And you know, back in the day, there wasn't so many detransitioners. And it's why I bring that question up. So why today? If it didn't happen before, why today? And you know, there's people in my community who are so pissed off at detransitioners. They don't want to talk to them. They got high, you know, hiding them. I disagree with that. Those detransitioners are gold. I feel so bad for them. I just have my heart breaks for them. But if we don't bring them into our community and we don't learn from them, we're idiots. And then that means to me, people don't care in the community. They don't care. Care. It's all about themselves. It's become a very me, me, me sort of space. Well, why do you think there are so many people detransitioning? Is it like a... That's a no-brainer. Like- no, that's a no-brainer. I want to know why you think people are detransitioning. <laughs> well, we have a whole podcast that will probably take years <laughs> to answer that question. So right I don't on. know. <laughs> in some, I think it's like a few main things. I think people are transitioning now who in other generations never would have even thought to transition. I think there is really not an appropriate level of psychological preparation for what the hell transition actually means. What does this mean in the long term? So people are not prepared. And lastly, I think people are living in an unreal fantasy about what being, what transitioning means. They think that they will functionally just become exactly the same thing as a quote cis person. And that is just not true. And I think there's entire industries that are willing to play along with this fantasy because it's really hard to look someone in the face and say, you know, honey, I know you really believe this, but let me tell you, the truth is A, B, and C. Nobody wants to disappoint a trans person. And you're not allowed to today, especially in the United States. I think Ireland, too. It's just yeah. really insane. We're not allowed to say anything. When I push, you, if you know me, I push on that. And I don't push on it because I want people to run around calling everybody a tranny. That's not why I push on it. I push on it because we cannot be that sensitive. And if we are overly sensitive to everything that happens to us, you are not living your life. Today, I get called she. Look at me. People still misgender me on purpose. It's clear. Yeah. But if my feelings got hurt, <laughs> I would just be like over in the corner cowering. It is so important that these kids are not sucked into the space of, ah, and they are. And so that is not okay with me. We are not creating a space where we have to move. I got better so that I could live in your world because I want to live in your world. I don't want to live in this world. I want to live in the world that's out there. Trans people are 0.0 what 5% of the population. Why are we living in a bubble of trans? It's not real. It's fake. And so you need to, the reason I transitioned is so that I could live in society and I could be a, a, a person who creates a million products and has an amazing life and is that kid who was called dummy. So mm-hmm. that is why people need to understand my transition was to save my life so that I could go back into the world again. And that's what I'm thinking is missing in the conversation is that why do you want to transition not to be trans this whole identity thing of i'm transitioning to be trans i never transitioned to be trans i transitioned to be buck and to be a man and to move back into the world so that was the red light for me or the thing that said wait a minute people are wanting to be trans that's an identity choice that is a choice to be a trans person uh, is not my identity. Trans is not my identity. It is part of my life, right? It is my space where I come from. But so you see what I mean? Yeah. Like, I don't understand yeah. this identity of trans. That that threw me off. Is that the no-brainer when, when we ask, you know, why are people <laughs> detransitioning? What's the no-brainer in, in your opinion? Mental health care. Bam. Nobody's going to mental health care. Not one of those detransitioners. Some of them maybe did, but they went to a gender. They went to a gender therapist. Gender therapists are geared to have you transition. They are in no way, shape or form going to open their mind specifically to say, wait a minute, maybe this is not, this is my experience with gender therapists who are only practicing in that space. And I think that there's gender therapists who need to be taught that's not all transition is for every child out there. And you need to have that in your, your, 
you need to be prepared to say, this isn't for you. Even if it's going to hurt that child's feelings, you need to be prepared to say, no, you're not trans, you're gay, or you're, you know, we're wiping out gayness. Like what? (laughs) That's why I really don't want to tell my part of the story where I was like being told I was a masculine woman my whole life when I wasn't, but I don't even want to tell that story anymore because I feel it's flipped. I feel the narrative has flipped now and it's the other way. And that scares me. I agree with you about the detransitioners. Myself and Sasha work and we were in the association for for detransitioners and, and oh, wow. uh, desisters, IATDD. However, um, it occurs to me, and I think the one thing that I've really noticed from working with detransitioners oh. is that uh, they, the, the therapy they got was very bad. I, I just can't get over the, the, the quality of the therapy. It was really bad quality, low quality therapy, if they got any therapy at all. But the question that comes to my mind is, it feels like, you know, you're, you're the, the vanguard. There you were, you know, in, I don't know what year it was that you were transitioning. What was it, 1992 or something like that? When was it? Uh, something like that? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, I don't even know. Yeah. Like, what is it? Thir- Twenty six years ago, nineteen ninety four. Yeah, yeah ninety four. That was it. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> so you transitioned then. Do you know any other trans men your age? Oh sure. Uh huh. Okay. So they were around. Tell me. It yeah. wasn't that they weren't around. They were mostly in San Francisco, maybe, or there, who were starting. Everyone. There was a small Yahoo group. And that started around the first year of my transition. And so there was a very small group of guys. Also look at FTM International. That was also a very popular. And in fact, I might even still have it. I have so much great stuff from my early transition that I kept. I even have that book. So there's a thing called uh-huh. FTM International. And that was a book that they would send around to all the guys. So it was very is small. That, is there trans men older than you? Oh, there's trans men older than me. Totally. Uh, uh, gosh, I can't think of his name right now. He works at W Path. He's one of the guys on W Path, which I'm not a fan of W Path. Just putting it out there. They're, no, they're, I'm not. They took mental health care off the. I'm like, what? Yeah. You people yeah. are sick, and self ID is sick. I'm telling you right <laughs> now. I don't care what anybody thinks about me. I'm going to say it, and I, and you know what? It's because I have a lot of experience. I'm not saying this to be a jerk, and I'm not saying this because I don't care. Well, you're saying because you were a soldier. You you've been through it. You know the physical reality of it. So you you That's said right. be careful, be careful. That's like transition. I'm telling kids. I'm telling you. I'm telling kids this. Get the right therapist. Spend time with your therapist, socially transition. That's what I had to do. I had to social transition before any hormones were put in my body. I had to dress, walk the world as Buck to see how the world interacted with me and how I interacted. And that was a huge, amazing plus part of me being grounded and who I am today, and never have I looked back. Never. Mm. It literally, <laughs> figuratively, everything changed my life. That's it's what a, I It's a very do. medicalized existence. It's very- That's right. That's right. Yeah. It's a medical space, and it's not anything. And now I get called true scum, and I get called trans medicalist. How rude and how disrespectful for a bunch of youngsters who now can just go and take hormones and have their, their surgeries paid for by, by, by the insurance companies. And I had to do what I had. And to call me those names, is, it just hurts my feelings. I'll be honest with you. It hurts my feelings. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. It's mm-hmm. gross. <laughs> what is it that you would want – um, our audience to understand because I think you're a very controversial figure. I think a lot of people look at your life experiences and the work you've done and project all kinds of things onto you for, for arguments that I may or may not agree with. But what do you think people really want to understand about you before we let you go today? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, being controversial is not such a bad thing. Uh, I'll be honest with you. I'll, I'll take it. I take that space. And I have no I have no problem getting kicked every day. I don't I, have I, I'm feeling you kind of revel in, in controversy. <laughs> I'm t- I've always been that guy. Do you know that? Since, I yeah. mean... Day one that I was brought on this earth. I've always been that dude. You cannot tell me what to do. Ask my parents. <laughs> I'm that dude. You will not tell me what to do. I will find my I own believe head. you. <laughs> I going to say, wait, Stella, and I just had a conversation about this. So maybe, <laughs> maybe yeah, this, it's a trait that we all share. So, it's so you're real- saying you own the controversial space that you're That's in. That's right. And the, and the reason, I, the only reason I'm controversial, and I'm going to tell you, the only reason I know is, is because I don't adhere 
to the language, to the ideology that I think is, there's an agenda. I will not be part of that. I refuse to be. So now I'm considered sort of like this bad, evil trans person who goes again. I'm a true scum. I'm a turf. I, I, I side with cisgender people. I saw, you know, I'm like this. Uh, it's so crazy. And I'm like, you guys are dividing. What are you doing? You're dividing. I'm actually trying to build bridges. I'm I'm the guy here in the middle that says, yeah, maybe you need to shut up, JK, and we can have a conversation and everything is cool. You're not trans. I don't necessarily think she's purposely transphobic. I think she just needs to have a talk with some trans people and we can all like figure it out. Everything she said, she has a right to say. She has a right to say that. She has a right to feel that. I, as I don't woman. think she's transphobic at all. I, think, I, don't, I don't think. I don't, her language can be a little, but who cares? Honestly, it doesn't mean anything to me. I, that's what I'm, I'm using her as an example. I'm the guy who says here, wait a minute, community. She's not doing that. And my community is like there. And I'm trying to like, that's me. And that's why I'm controversial because I'm the guy who wants to create coexistence. I'm the guy who wants to sort of like, but nobody wants to listen. Yeah. <laughs> and so it becomes that. So that's why I'm controversial because I don't necessarily pick sides. Right. And I look at everything from this space and I make my own choices. And so I think because of that, people on some level secretly admire that, but they won't admit it. And they just say you're a bad trans person. So that's what I know. <laughs> you're holding a space in the middle of so many axes here. That's right. And I think that, that drives everybody a little crazy, but right. <laughs> I think we really love it. And we're, we're so glad to have had you on. Thank you, um, thank you for your work. Both of you. Thank you for your work. I totally appreciate it. It means a lot to me. So I appreciate you guys. Thank you. So where can our audience find you if they'd like to learn more about Buck Angel? Uh, buckangel.com twitter buckangel watch out for twitter uh <laughs> ig little chiller <laughs> buckangel and then facebook which i'm not big fan but that's official buckangel so okay. you can catch me on twitter being very political you can catch me on ig putting more about my story on there okay Pre appreciate you Brilliant. thank you so much you guys and Thanks, much. yeah it was thank really you so much good conversation thank you thank you Thanks for joining us this week on Gender, A Wider Lens. This podcast is partially sponsored by RIME, Rethink Identity Medicine Ethics. RIME is a nonprofit organization dedicated to improving the long-term care for gender-variant individuals. Visit RethinkIME.org to learn more. If you found value in our show, please review us on iTunes and subscribe so you never miss an episode. And you can follow us on Twitter, Facebook or Instagram. Just go to our link tree. That's linktr.ee slash wider lens pod. Our discussions are for educational purposes only and are not intended as a substitute for mental health services. 